Hi guys. Some of you guys that follow this channel might recall that I've swapped out to a Thimline 720S wheel. It's a great wheel and I stand by my review of it saying that it is a fantastic wheel to use and I'm having a lot of fun driving with it. However, the model I have has a slight omission to it that can be quite tiresome in endurance racing or any race where you've got to do some kind of pit stop management. That omission is it doesn't have a funky switch or a point of view hat or a D-pad or anything like that. So to get around that, we're going to be building ourselves a little pit management button box. And that's going to give us some functionality like navigating in direction and switching between the various MFD displays that you have within a set of course of competition. This button box can be used with other games, but I'm explicitly kind of making this one for ACC. What do you have to consider when you're building a button box? Well, there, there are a few things actually. You've got to consider your button placements. You've got to consider the size of the box you want, how many buttons you want, what kinds of control you want. Do you want to have rotaries? Do you want to have toggles? And how you're going to fit this all in. You also have to consider whether those buttons are going to be latching or momentary. For the most part, when it comes to building a button box, you're going to be preferring to have momentary buttons because latching ones can cause problems with ghosting of the controls if you're using a button matrix. On top of that, you're going to have to consider where you're going to be placing that button box. Obviously, placement may determine the size of the button box. Where your USB ports are, you know, have access to it. You're going to have to try and use something that's wireless or you're going to be using something it's just using a very long USB cable. And then, of course, how you mount it. In my case, it's on an 8020 rig. So I'm just going to be drilling through the back of it and then mounting that directly to the rig. When you start thinking about your button placements, it's good to have a look around inside the project box that you've purchased for this project. Or if you haven't purchased one yet, you can have a look at those online. Hopefully, they give you an exploded view of it so you can have a good look around beforehand. What I'm using for this particular project is a snap fit unit, so it doesn't have any screws at the front and it just latches on by a few lugs on each corner. That's a blessing and a curse, really, based on the size that this is. So, when we go through the design process, I'll talk through some of the software that I've tried using for different button boxes, as well as what I did for this particular project. Being such a small button box, I've just really, in this case, I've done the design on the front of the box. When you're building your button box, don't forget how you're going to be using it. When you're going to be using what kind of circumstance, because that's going to be a very good indicator for what sized controls you're going to have and your particular placement for your cluster. So for me, I'm in VR. I know I'm not going to be able to see the control box, so I'm going to have to make sure that I can navigate without looking. This particular button box is pretty inexpensive. It's got six momentary buttons, the case, the USB micro cable, an Arduino Pro Micro, and a little bit of wire and solder. So it's fairly basic. However, you can build more complex solutions using a very similar process. For now, though, this project is going to be small and inexpensive. Design-wise, we're going to be having to sketch out the layout of the button box. This particular project being so lightweight, I'm just going to be doing that on top of the masking tape, which is on top of this case. But in more complex scenarios, you might want to be using tools like Lucid Charts, Draw.io, um, your favorite graphics package of choice. But just be aware that you're going to need to make sure that things are to scale to ensure that you have room within your project box for this particular layout. You can see here, I also tried using SketchUp to give me a very quick idea kind of layout. I was going to 
guess my point here is to just use something that you're going to be comfortable with. So after marking down all the points that we want the buttons to be, it's sometimes a good idea to put, if you've got any washers or rings that fit around the buttons or switches, put those around your design just to double check that you're going to have space and that there is going to be some material between them. Because if there's, they're too close together, they're going to end up either not fitting properly or not being able to be drilled because they will just destroy the plastic. So once you're happy with that, get your drill out, start making holes. Remember to punch these first to make sure that your drill bit doesn't wander. And when you are working with all of this um, plastic mess, it's sometimes handy to just hoover it up in between. Once all of those are drilled out, you can peel off the masking tape and you will have a nice clean cut. And you can start testing your fittings. This one was actually quite a tight fit against the edge of the case, but it, it did eventually all fit in, as we can see here. So that's a test fitting of the buttons. It's a reasonable layout something that's usable and it looks reasonably tidy. Next up, let's draw up the circuit diagram for our button matrix. I'm just joining up all the points so I have an idea of how I'm going to be mapping out the rows and the columns based on the button numbers that I've already defined. Because I'm using a D-pad-like layout, the uh, buttons are directional, and I've drawn that on here. It's always handy to have something like this. So when you are building a more complex box, you can have a look at your diagram just to make sure you haven't soldered things in in the wrong order or done something else that's going to render your sketch very confusing when you compile it and then test. So once we've done that, we tin the various rows up and columns. I'm just grouping these with an individual wire, and that wire will then be used to connect the Arduino. I'm just tidying it up with a bit of heat shrink. And all of these, I've just cut the size. they're all in, we can just use a multimeter to test that there is some electrical connection between them. Then we can get our helping hand out to help us to solder onto the Arduino. If you don't have a helping hand, you can do this without. In fact, when I soldered a Nano on initially, I'd done that without a helping hand but I wanted it to be a little bit tidier with the Pro Micro. Let's make sure we don't have any cold joints as we go along. Fairly easy soldering job. Once they're all in place, then I'm just going to tape it up to make sure we don't have any contact between electrical connections because we are going to be fitting this in pretty tightly. The back of this box isn't very deep. It's just a little bit deeper than the length of the switches, so probably should have given myself more space. Next up, we get the sketch loaded up into the Arduino. So we plug the Arduino in, make sure that we can see it within the Arduino panel of SimHub. If we can't see it, make sure we're scanning all ports. And then once we're able to see it, we go to setup and start from scratch. We pick our Pro Micro board, which we've got selected here. And we're going to give it a unique code here. I'm using my driver number. You can use whatever you like, but it does have to be unique. Give it a nice name. I want to call it SimHub something or other, then 
give it a name that you are going to be able to remember. Enable gamepad. And enable button matrix. From here, we select our rows and pins based on what we soldered earlier. And this is again adhering to the design that we set out. And then we upload to the Arduino. It should compile without error. If you do get an error, it might be the version of SimHub you're using. So make sure you're using the latest version as there was a hotfix for compilation errors. And we should be able to see the device under other devices. And we can test it out using the Windows control panel. And that's pretty much it. You have a working input device that you can use as a button box. And here you can see I've mounted the button box on the 8020 rig ready for the Spa 24 hours race. So perhaps Spa in a 24 hour race was a bit of a baptism by fire for this button box, but it worked flawlessly. I did have a little bit of trouble grabbing for the button box whilst racing in anger. But after a little bit of time, I managed to get to the point that I could feel for it and then perform the functions that I need to even when I was in a race on a straight. So that's pretty decent. It works flawlessly. I had no problems with the buttons itself. The only slight gripe I have with the button box is that it flexes a little. And because of the small size of it, it doesn't necessarily have enough space for the cabling. So I, I think I'm going to have to stump up for a um, slightly bigger box later on. But because this is very small in size, it doesn't get in the way of my driving. And other than having to try and grab Fred in VR, I've no complaints, honestly. I think maybe when I raise it up slightly, you can see some cabling in my second camera here, but that's actually just for the camera. So if I raise up that button box a little bit, I think I'll be able to make a grab for it a little easier. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the result. And it did mean I was able to race in a 24 hour race with very little in the way of problems when it comes to my pit management. Overall, this is a fairly straightforward way to get new input devices onto your rig. However, it doesn't really beat having those controls directly on your wheel, which is the closest input to you, especially when we're talking about racing in VR. There's a lot to digest in what we've gone through here, but hopefully you'll be able to go through that and it helps you guys out. Now for me, this project cost around 30 pounds, probably around 40 euros. And the main reason for that is because I picked those parts from places that I could be able to build this within a few days because I had an imminent spa race coming up that really needed me to have the ability to manipulate my settings for the pit window. But if you don't mind waiting a few weeks, you can just grab them from somewhere like AliExpress, save yourself a ton of money and have a dirt cheap button box. And then there's always going down the funky switch route if you wanted a control that gives you a little more versatility. Of course, it's a bit more painful to try and wire that thing, but if you want the additional control it gives you, then you're gonna have to buy that bullet. Hopefully this little project gives you some inspiration to go and try out something like this yourself. If you have done this already, or you intend to do something like this soon, please drop a comment in the comments section below. Love to hear from you. I love to hear from people making their own DIY projects and their experiences in doing so. For me, this little project was a stepping stone. I'm making bigger button boxes and I will share that in future videos. But this is a stepping stone for me to building my own custom wheel that I'm hoping to do next year. So if you did enjoy this video, please don't forget to hit that like button. 
and subscribe to this channel if you are interested in seeing more content like this. Until next time, guys, goodbye for now.